Okay, let's start. Um, today we uh, start again with our uh, monthly appoint appointment with Zoom Cafe. Uh, for people who are here uh, for the first time, every month we prepare a special topic to discuss together and to give some tools about uh, managing money with Bible principles to uh, everybody. And today our topic is money mentoring. Uh, we will start a money mentoring program really soon. And at the end, we will speak about this. And today is a pleasure for me to introduce my colleague, Pavel. Pavel has uh, years of experience in this topic. Uh, in his professional way and also organizing many events. So let's start together. And Pavel, thank you for your time. And I'm sure that we will have a good time together to learn other, other things. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rita, uh, for uh, intro introducing me. And it's really uh, mentoring and coaching has been part of my life uh, in some way or another in the last 20 years. So it's um, it's a great honor to share some of the things that I learned uh, the easier or the more difficult way. So the topic is money uh, mentoring. And um, I want to start with asking you a question. Have you ever given an advice to someone? I believe yes. And I believe also that in some cases, this person followed your advice. But in many cases, they didn't. And probably the consequences weren't, weren't good, maybe catastrophic in some cases. Honestly, I've been on both sides of the equation. I've been on the side of receiving uh, advice and following and not following. And I've been also on the side of giving advice and the other person not following it, which made me feel uh, not very, very well. So I spent a lot of time to figure out what makes people make good decisions and uh, follow advices on wise people. And it's a process which I want to uh, share, share with you because it's not just delivering of content. This is one of the misconceptions of mentoring that you teach, uh, simply teach someone. Yes, you teach someone, but there is a whole process, not just the content. In many cases, I mean, we give advice. And here is uh, on the screen, you see uh, a simple advice, which is very important. And very, If people follow it, they will be rich. If gov governments follow it, uh, our countries will prosper. Spend less, earn more, save more. So easy, but in reality, so uh, few people follow it because it's not just uh, telling people what to do. And there is a story of a um, very popular financial coach. Uh, her name is Tammy Wally. A few years ago, she um, made a TED talk and um, I don't recommend her personal lifestyle, but as a money coach, she has good points uh, to share. So I wanna be clear on this. And uh, in this talk, she um, tells the story of how back in 2007, her brother had financial troubles. He was in um, a very difficult situation. So she went to visit him and talk to him. They spent two hours in Starbucks and generally uh, she gave them these advices. Spend less, earn more, save more. Two weeks later, Unfortunately, her brother committed suicide. This was quite a shocking event for, for uh, anyone. And for her, it provoked her, it provoked her to think deeper about uh, financial coaching, that it's not just telling people what to do, but there are many, many evo emotions around money and we need to manage them. There are many wrong beliefs which lead us to making wrong financial decisions as it was with her brother and even with herself. So she started studying the topic and realized that it's a whole process of um, unwinding the old wrong, wrong beliefs and learning 
new ones. And actually, this is what we also do uh, in um, our financial circles, but with more biblical approaches. And before digging deeper into the um, uh, process of mentoring, uh, I want to clear some misconceptions. And um, we often hear the words coaching, mentoring, counseling, discipleship, consulting, and we often use them interchangeably, use them as synonyms. But these uh, M&Ms have different colors and different meanings, and I want to clear this by presenting you a chart. I want to, uh, on this diagram, you see how much the person who receives advice is involved in the learning process. So on the one side, you see almost no involvement from the recipient. And on the other side, you see complete involvement on the recipient side. So oh, first teaching, we, oh, when a teacher delivers a content, it's a one-way communication. The teacher knows everything, he tells uh, the other person and the other person is expected to learn, listen, learn and apply. That's all, no interaction between uh, the two of them. Another level, consulting, the consultant comes with an expertise, but they usually use a tool. They have a long form, a long paper or Excel sheet. If you fill your data, you fill your numbers, um, give answers. And at the end, they come with a magical formula, which produces a report, which gives you guidelines of what to do uh, personally or organizational wise. There is a little bit of input on your side or as a recipient, but the consultant knows most of it. Then we have the counseling on the spectrum. And then we have a dialogue between the counselor and the counselee. They, uh, the counselor still comes with the know-how. They have tools, techniques they use, but uh, there is much more in input that comes from uh, the client. And uh, together through the relationship, they find solutions to the problems. Continuing, we see the mentoring. And with the mentor still possesses a lot of knowledge and experience, but he or she is expected to uh, listen more and receive more information from the mentee because the mentee has unique context. It's not just sharing from your wisdom, it's how to apply the wisdom in the specific context of the mentee. If for this person, there is, should be a lot, of, a lot of sharing from the mentee's side. And finally, we have the coaching relationship where the coach believes that the client has the potential to make their own decisions. And the coach is there only to provide the right environment uh, through tools and questioning so that the mentee, the mentee or the coachee makes the proper decisions for themselves. Internally with Bert in Compass, we had discussions whether we should use financial mentoring or financial coaching. And we realized that uh, in our case, we use direction. We give people direction from the Bible. And we expect people uh, as a result of our relationship to change according to the Bible. So uh, it can't be coaching because in coaching is completely non-directional. So we decided, that we decided that our approach will be financial mentoring. You, you don't see uh, on the picture discipleship. So... Where is discipleship in this picture? This is the wrong question. The question is how all of these things fit into discipleship. And actually, discipleship is most important. We, uh, we as Christians want uh, the people to grow in maturity in Christ-likeness. And uh, for this purpose, we can use different approaches. Sometimes we need to teach the person. We need to teach them the, what the Bible says. In other cases, uh, they have a lot of knowledge. They just need a few questions to help them get clarity. In other cases, we need to share from our experience as mentors. So as disciples, we put different hats depending on the situation. And we know from Paul speaking to Thessalonians, he tells them that in some cases, he was a mother for them, a caring, nursing mother. In other care cases, he was a directive father. So Paul used this situational approach and we need to uh, learn from this. So with this, I think we're ready to jump into um, the discipleship process. So as I said, it's not just content, it's a whole process, starting with the mentor, the mentee, and the Holy Spirit. 
you can read a lot mentoring and coaching secure books and there are great techniques and tools they can share but they miss very important things without the holy spirit you can't achieve the results that you want uh, to achieve so it's very important to include it in all this in uh, this process equally then we have the relationship between the mentor the mentee and the holy spirit we have goals goals that the mentee wants to achieve but also we as mentor wants to see some results spiritual results fruits uh, in the mentee's life but there is a process that takes us from where we are to the goals uh, which uh, are supposed to be achieved there is the toolbox of the mentor and i love this we'll spend some time some more time on it and uh, only then comes the curriculum only then comes the lessons that we want to um, provide to the mentee. So we will uh, jump into each one of these elements now. First, the role and uh, the personality of the mentor. The mentor is someone who is dependent on the Lord. This is where we start. We can't mentor others uh, if we are not uh like if you're not connected to the Lord, if we are like um, like uh, the, the 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 branch and the tree, we seek uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the in the in in the relationship in the life of of the mentee. We pray, we pray before meetings, we pray at start of meetings, we pray uh, during meetings, we pray at the end of meetings. We pray be between the meetings because apart from God, we can't do anything. And we seek wisdom from the Bible. We, uh, we can't give people something that we don't have. So the mentor needs to be constantly deeply rooted into the wisdom of the word of God. Now, uh, I, wanna, I want us to think about what makes us good mentors. Each one of us, uh, has come to this uh, meeting because we probably uh, have uh, um, a desire, a wish to mentor others. So I want to stop for a few seconds and personally, on your, on, your, on your own, think of what strengths do you have, what God-given strengths do you have that makes you a good mentor? I believe uh, you found you found such strengths and uh, have them in mind when you uh, prepare for your mentoring sessions. Remember your, your strengths and apply them, put them in action, because this will be a blessing, a blessing uh, for the others. Another important uh, aspect uh, of our own preparation as mentors is to manage ourselves so that we are fully present at the meeting. It's very sad and very bad if we can't concentrate on the person in front of us, if we can't give them our full attention because we will miss important information. We will break trust with the other person. So come prepared for the meetings, have a good sleep, pray, uh, resolve any issues if you have uh, during the day so that you come and be really there for the mentee. Also, authenticity is very important. We need to be honest with the person. We need to be the real, the real us, sharing successes, sharing failures, uh, so that the other person know that we are a human, a human being. Especially for young people, it's critical that we are authentic. Otherwise, trust is broken and people uh, run away. And very important, empathy. Uh, empathy is key in, in the relationship. And I found a very good definition, which I want to read uh, to you. And uh, this is uh, the empathy is the ability to enter deeply into the subjective world of the mentee or their internal frame of reference and understand the identity of their feelings without losing your own identity. You know, each person has different uh, worldviews. They are very subjective. And uh, when we listen well, when we show empathy, we understand the way the other person see the world. And this is, this is empathy. We understand their feelings. We are like entering in their room and uh, see the world as they see it. But it's very important to not 
step into their shoes, as very often is said, because otherwise we can be uh, sidetracked, we can be distracted. Empathy is different from sympathy. Uh, when you sympathize with others, we, we, you feel the same feelings and um, you lose your own perspective. But it is critically important for the mentee that we keep our uh, perspective and we provide this perfect perspective later into the relationship. Uh, it is a skill. It is like a muscle that you can train. And after we finish the meeting and tomorrow, you can practice empathy with your colleagues, with your family members and friends, and this will improve your ability to empathize. And it's also an attitude. Uh, you, it's, it's an attitude of the heart. You should want to, uh, to be empathetic, otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't work. You should be non-judgmental because in this way we create a, self in, a safe environment for the person and uh, they can share freely about uh, their failures and trust is built and we can provide uh, more and more into the mentoring if, uh, if we have this trust based on the non-judgmental attitude. And uh, we have to be humble. It's not about us, it's about God, it's about the other person. Okay, we studied the mentor. Now we will look at uh, the mentee. According to the uh, famous uh, management consultant, Bob Bill, a mentee is someone with a potential. We have to see the potential in the other person. Otherwise, it, it won't work uh, with the mentoring relationship. We see the potential, but we also realize that this person has a need. They have a need and we can help them uh, in um, achieving, overcoming what is in front of them. And we also have some relationship with them. We know each other a little bit maybe, and we can spend more informal time to get them know better and then start the relationship. But according to Peter Briscoe, the founder of Compass Europe, there is another approach. And he says that he's looking for people who are faithful, uh, who are available, and who are teachable. These are the best disciples, the best mentees who will really take it on uh, to, the, to the others. Remember that we mentor the whole person. People may come to us with financial questions, with financial issues, but it's never only the finances. There may be marriage uh, issues that pop up. There may be career decisions. There may be work-related situations. There can be anything. There could be childhood trauma. Remember that there is a whole person standing in, in front of you and we mentor actually the whole person. We move the whole person closer to God, not just their finances. Also, this person is created in the image of God. God put in these people a uh, unique set of gifts, of talents, and uh, we should honor this person and love this, uh, this person because God created them the way uh, uh, they are. But uh, people also are influenced by sin, and uh, this we will reflect on their actions. Uh, be prepared for this. Uh, when I was uh, younger, I was very disappointed uh, in my discipleship because I was seeing how people don't follow their commitment, they make, uh, commit sins, and so on and so on. Uh, but it took me a long, long time to realize that this is part of life and we need to love people and help them get back on their feet and recover, recover from their sins. Now, uh, let us look at the um, uh, role of the Holy Spirit in the relationship. We can't do anything without God in the relationship. There are many secular books, many techniques, but uh, they can give just partial results. Only if we um, uh, rely on the Holy Spirit, the person can, uh, uh, can uh, leave the full transformation that he needs. Holy Spirit is the perfect comforter. He speaks to people and he can heal wounds. He can heal wounds that no one else can, uh, can heal in this person's life. And he gently directs the people. Uh, we may be talking for, for years to someone, uh, but the Holy Spirit can really move the people into the right direction. So prayer is critical and uh, dependence on uh, the Holy Spirit. Let us look at the relationship between the mentor, the mentee, and the Holy Spirit. First, it is very important that the mentor and the mentee build rapport. This is a high level of trust between uh, the two of them. 
they feel they can share with each other things that they can't share with other people. Uh, they they listen uh, to each other, especially the mentor, the mentor listens, they provide non, no judgments, and the, the mentee feels safe to share things that no one else uh, can, can be shared with. So the rapport is critical uh, for the relationship. Agape love, uh, this is the love that only God can give, but we should be imitators of God, which means that we should uh, try as much as possible to love the person as God loves them and provide forgiveness and support and compassion. Uh, points to God and the Bible. It's not about us. It's not about the money. It's about growing in maturity, knowing the Bible, knowing God uh, more and better. In this relationship, also we listen, listen well. And this is my favorite part. And I will um, spend more time on it. The experts give three levels of listening. And uh, in the first level, you, they call it internal. You listen, but when you hear about the experience of the mentee, you start uh, thinking about your own related experiences. And in this way, you're sidetracked and you uh, can't listen to what else the, the mentee says. You are looking at the things from your own worldview, not from the worldview of the mentee. And this, um, you know, this can lead to... Um, to wrong advice that you give, to wrong uh, guidance uh, that you uh, that you provide, and this could this could happen to anyone. Last Sunday at church, I spoke to a lady and uh, she asked me something, and I immediately responded uh, an advice that I would give to Christians. But later I realized that she was asking me for how to speak to her non-believing husband. So you see, if you don't listen, if you are quick to answer, if you think from your own perspective, you miss the point, you miss the important things. But when you listen on a second level, which is the focused listening, the listening which is oriented to the other person, you start to understand what's really going on in the life of the person and help them uh, truly. But experts give a third layer of this, and this is uh, global listening in which you listen for what is not said. You, you listen for, uh, the you, you observe the mood of the person. You observe changes in the mood, changes in, in the way uh, the person expresses themselves. For example, they may share something uh, about something very good that happened in their life, but at the same time, they're very sad, which speaks that there is some internal conflict, conflict probably. So this is the listening that if you're prepared for the meeting and fully present for the mentee, will give true, true uh, results. Uh, in the relationship, we give compassion, we confront from time to time, especially when there is a sin or unchanged behavior. Uh, we look for the root, root problems of issues. We give tailored advice like uh, Paul. Every time he was speaking to different audience, he was uh, changing uh, the way he communicates uh, depending on the audience. Still the same message, but uh, tailored to the audience. And we are oriented toward action. In our walking with the, man, with the mentee, we inspire them to make actions, actions of uh, moving forward, actions of change in their life. With this, I will stop uh, for a moment and ask if there are any, any questions at this point. It's okay if there aren't. I have plenty of content to deliver, <laughs> but uh, don't worry. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. There will be also a second uh, uh, opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end of the second part. Io avrei una domanda. Il mio problema è l'inglese. Okay, provo a tradurre. Tornando dal discorso iniziale dell'insegnante, del mentoring e del coaching, sì. da quello che ho capito dall'inglese hanno tutti cinque, cinque i ruoli, il modo di insegnare, però ognuno di loro, il loro modo di approcciarsi è differente a seconda della loro esperienza e di quello che hanno preso, da quello che ho capito. Però io vorrei chiedere, comunque tutti e cinque hanno avuto esperienza su quello che 
naturalmente insegnano. Mm, non so perché c'è una differenza tra loro cinque, cioè quello che ho capito io dal discorso. Ok, so Andrea wants to understand better why you divide the process in five steps. Uh, and if in each step uh, you had some experience, no? Uh, teaching, uh, mentoring, coaching, etc. Uh, uh, it's... Um... I, I, there, it is, this is not one process. These are different approaches which we use in different uh, in different scenarios, in different cases. Uh, when you when you meet a new believer, they don't know anything about the Bible, and you teach them how to read the Bible. And when you stand behind the pulpit, you teach uh, from the Bible. So this is very different from mentoring it's nothing uh, in common when you mentor someone you first listen and only when appropriate give advice in most cases you give uh, questions okay thank you uh, i have a question yeah. um, what is your advice for those countries with no culture of mentoring. Uh, for example, uh, in Italy, we, we are a country with a teaching culture, but no mentoring culture. So do you have some advices for countries who are really difficult to apply the mentoring uh, yes. Yes. in general? Yeah. Uh, generally, it's difficult, yes, but um, what uh, you can do is to start uh, hanging out with someone, as they say, to start spending time with, with, with someone. You can go for a coffee, you can invite that person at home, and at this point, there is no mentoring. It's just building relationships, uh, and only when you build some level of relationship, only then you may invite the person into a mentoring relationship. Of course, this is uh, speaking when you personally give mentoring. If you want to start a mentoring system in your church or a mentoring um, system in your organization, uh, that's a more longer process. Again, you may start with one or two person uh, who are more open to it. And when one the others see the results, then uh, they will also want to join it. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, if someone has other questions, uh, you can also write on our chat. If not, Pavel, you can start the second part and maybe the picture will be more completed. Thank yes, you. Yes, exactly. Let's, let's go on. Uh, and now uh, we move to the next part, which are the goals, the end results we want to see in that person. And there is this famous book of Stephen Covey, uh, Seven Habits of si Highly Successful People, which first chapter is begin with the end in mind. This reminds us of the important, importance to have a clear vision of what we want to achieve at the end of, uh, of the relationship. And I will give you some suggestions. We want to see a behavioral transformation. Behavior is something what we see in the person. Uh, there are particular uh, actions, there are particular ways of, of doing things, uh, of managing their money. But we also want to see a character transformation. And this is a very good illustration with the iceberg, very popular, but still <laughs> useful. Uh, you know, the, the iceberg is actually moved from the part that is under the surface, under the surface. It moves uh, the whole iceberg. And uh, it's the character uh, and uh, our beliefs that uh, internal, they're internal, but they show outwardly in our actions. So what are the, the behaviors that we want to see in the person? They, we want to see them that they recognize the worship of Christ in all areas of their lives, including finances. We want to see these people saving, budgeting, investing, being generous, being honest, and many other 
uh, outward behaviors. But also we wanna see a character transformation. And here is, um, there are different ways to put it. We may speak about the virtues that uh, we wanna see in that person. We wanna see the fruits of the spirit and we wanna see more Christ-likeness, more of the attributes of the moral uh, character of, uh, of uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And they're overlap a little bit. So I'll quickly go through um, each one. Peter Briscoe is working uh, on these seven virtues of um, finances based on the Bible. And he will soon produce uh, material on it. But in this, um, he lists seven virtues. He calls them prudence, which means one's planning, wise planning, justice, uh, which is fairness, uh, temperance, which is self-control, fortitude, resilience, and courage, faith, which means trust and confidence, hope, which is optimism and belief, love, generosity, and compassion. You, you may be hearing these terms for the first time, so maybe it is easier if you look at the fruits of the spirits from Galatians 3 chapter, 5 chapter, we, we know them all, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is we want to see in the life of the person we mentor. Or the moral uh, uh, attributes of Christ, like love, compassion, humility, righteousness, forgiveness, truth, obedience, justice, and servanthood. So you see there are uh, two layers two layers of this. And uh, yeah, yeah, now we will walk, I will walk you through the process, how to start from where the person is and get them to this point of transformation. So when you start meeting uh, with a with a uh, pros, uh, with a mentee, you go through a, some kind of a U shape uh, uh, U shape uh, relationship. You start meeting with the person. As I said, it can be more informally at the beginning. Then you start talking about finances, and people share the mentee shares about their concerns, about their goals, about their situation. You ask more questions and both of you understand more, more of what is going on in the life of the person. Uh, you get a better picture of what uh, you, you both want to achieve. But when you continue and ask powerful questions, and we will talk about them in a few minutes, you both become aware of a deeper issues of beliefs rooted in the life of this person, which leads them in making the wrong decisions. Something like the brother of Tami Lali that I shared you uh, at the beginning. There are uh, probably uh, some trauma in the life of the person, some uh, experiences of, um, of um, being poor probably that traumatize the person, or uh, maybe he has a, an experience when they lost a job and they had difficulties, or um it can be just um not being honest you know if someone uh, is not honest and this leads to a series of negative uh, consequences or if the person is overspending this this um, may speak about uh, something that is missing in the life of the person that only god can feel so um by asking questions you find out about these beliefs and if you have the relationship of trust of rapport, then you can openly challenge uh, these beliefs. And the person will be open uh, to think about it and to, to change uh, these beliefs. And this is the time when you can start speaking more about what the Bible says. And hearing what the Bible says and realizing that their old behavior was wrong, the people start transforming. And uh, this is a very powerful moment. You're at, uh, it seems like you're at the bottom because um, maybe the person at first is uh, disappointed. They're disillusioned of their wrong beliefs, but this unlocks their future. It unlocks potential because now they know what to do. And with this new knowledge, they start making small steps. You plan them together and they start climbing the hill and through uh, down the road, through a uh, relationship, if you keep them accountable, if you encourage them and give them feedback, uh, they will uh, reach this stability, financial stability, and they will um, have a transformed, transformed uh, character. So this is a process that you, that you lead people through. And you see the uh, iceberg again. It was 
uh, it was the outward behavior at first, uh, but then we realized that there are deeper issues. And once we started making uh, uh, small steps of improvement, we again uh, came uh, on, the, on the surface with a new set of behaviors. Now I wanna spend some time talking about the tools that a mentor uses in this process of mentoring um, the other person. Definitely start with self-assessment. Um, it's uh, it's very painful to start with giving feedback or, or, or deep questions. Self-assessment assessment is very helpful for people to get in a safe way, a uh, better uh, picture of where they are. It may be wrong, self-assessments are not the best tool, but it's a good beginning. People become aware of uh, what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. And one example of such test is the 4-H assessment developed by Ron Bull. And we have this test and we, will, we can provide it for you. And there is a set of questions that relate to the heart, to the health, to the habits, financial habits, and hope, financial hope of uh, the person. And it's a good start and it can give you as a mentor direction of where to start or where to focus more in the relationship. This is another interesting tool that we have. Uh, it's a book called Seven Money Types with a test. And uh, they studied the, the, um, um, the fathers uh, from the Bible. And now, like for example, Abraham is uh, known for his hospitality and so on. And you can find out more about your money, uh, money type and um, natural, natural behavior. Besides uh, tests, I want to suggest a model for leading the meeting. Because when uh, you have a meeting with uh, the mentee, they will come with their problems or their dreams and they will hijack you somehow. They will speak about this and you can sp spend the whole meeting of speaking about their problems or their, their dreams. There should be a framework for the conversation in order, in order to achieve some results. And this Tigron model is like a navigation system. So first start with a topic. What do you want to talk? Whether it will be debt or investments or savings or generosity, you decide on a topic for the meeting. Then you, um, and then you have uh, the goal. This is the results or the steps that the client will have at the end of this particular meeting. So if uh, it's a meeting about debt, at the end, probably he wants to have a plan for paying his next payments or a whole repayment plan, depending what you agree for this meeting. Uh, after you clarify the goal for the meeting, you only then start exploring, exploring uh, the reality. It's very important uh, to um, spend a few minutes on the topic and the goal. Otherwise, you don't know where you're going. This is like the GPS system on your car. You need to know where you're going. And after you define the destination, you uh, you start exploring where you are at the moment. And um, here you ask questions which help the mentee understand more about themselves. It's not about you receiving information. It's about the mentee learning more about themselves. Uh, so it's not just about uh, complaining. You should lead this part with powerful questions. And it's very interesting. It's a great joy when you spend some good time on exploring the reality, suddenly the mentee starts coming up with suggestions, with ideas of what they can do. And here we come to the options. In this, um, in this stage, you ask questions to help um, the, the mentee clear several options in front of them to, uh, to realize what are the possibilities. And then uh, you decide on one specific, you help them uh, evaluate the different options and uh, decide the way forward. And then you keep them accountable on the very specific steps, like when they will call uh, the bank, when they will uh, talk to their spouse, uh, who they will talk to, <laughs> and so on. Such small details that you make sure that they, they really make the decision. Um, powerful questions. Uh, this is a huge topic, and I want to... Um, summarize it through a very interesting book, which is called The Financial Wisdom of Ebenezer Scrooge. This book is written by financial coaches and they use the book Christmas Carol of, um, of Charles Dickens and uh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, the main character, 
he he's very rich person uh, who lives in misery. He doesn't realize how much money he has. He's not generous. He doesn't give money to anyone, uh, even on Christmas. And he pays extremely small wage to his quirk. And his quirk lives in misery. But on Christmas, uh, uh, Scrooge is visited by three spirits. The spirit of the past reminds him of his painful childhood. The spirit of the present, present shows him how much money he has and how miserably he lives. And the spirit of the future tells him what will happen if he doesn't change. Uh, and uh, how he will die and no one will care and people will steal his possessions. So he's very stressed and he changes based on these meetings with these three spirits. And uh, he starts being generous. He increases the salary of his employee and so on. And the, the authors of this book come with three sets of questions. Questions related to the past, questions related to the you know, present, and questions related to the future. I will not read them now. I will send you the PowerPoint. Uh, but I want to emphasize a few things. All these questions are open questions. This means that they are uh, questions, what, when, how, and so on. Uh, these questions give opportunity to mentee to think for themselves and to explore the situation. And it's very important that they learn things for themselves, not that we receive information. For example, I'll just read a couple of questions. Um, what are your earliest memories related to money? Probably people rarely ask themselves this question. So um, they can learn a lot if they uh, think about it. Or um, how do you make financial decisions today? We know what decisions they make, but what is the process? Maybe they never thought how they uh, make these decisions. Maybe they will realize that they never consult with their spouse or they, they never ask uh, for wisdom from a friend or they never pray when make decisions. So these are helpful questions that will uh, help them understand uh, their behavior. Or what financial success look like for you? What challenges uh, you have, what changes you need to make to reach uh, your financial goals? Maybe people never realize they need to make any changes in their life. So these are the questions that are powerful that reveal new things uh, to the mentee. Also, it's very important to um, increase the self-awareness of the mentee through um, these questions. And there are areas where the mentee um, doesn't know about themselves, but other people see them. Maybe other people see some things in their lives, but they don't see them. These are the blind spots. And here it's very, uh, the role of the mentor is important to provide, provide feedback, uh, to, um, to challenge. There are areas uh, where the mentee knows themselves, but other people don't know. This could be a hidden potential, which uh, because of some wrong beliefs was never able to, to, be, to be revealed. And here we can, for a safe environment, help the mentee uh, really grow and uh, show their potential. But here there, is, there can be also sins. The sin is hidden and uh, we may need to confront the person. And the most interesting part is where the person doesn't know themselves and the other person uh, uh, don't know. There are uh, such areas and through powerful questions, we can unlock really, really the potential of the mentee. And some exercises to help you uh, increase the self-awareness of the mentee, like you can ask them to list all their uh, assets and liabilities, to review bank statements, to go through receipts, uh, to do personality tests like Clifton Strength Finder and 16 personalities, to ask friends and family and colleagues for feedback. This is the so-called 360 degree feedback and to start journaling. Now, if you start taking notes and observe what's happening in your life, this will be very, very helpful. A few others uh, like uh, challenging the person, uh, adding one habit to another, homework assignments and feedback are also very important. Maybe habit stacking will be interesting for you. This is uh, when you have the person has a good habit, and you want to teach them do something uh, something new, but they 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 can't commit to the new thing. For example, um, they wanna uh, they wanna start reading the Bible regularly, and uh, they don't do it, but they love drinking coffee. So they in the morning when they drink their first coffee, they can attach uh, reading the Bible to the drinking of coffee, and in this way, 
uh, they can uh, start loving also reading uh, the Bible. There will be a whole course on mentoring which will start next year and we'll dig deeper into each of these elements. And only then, finally, we reach to the curriculum. You said, uh, we, we love teaching, we love telling people things from our curriculum, but actually there is a longer process to get to the, to get to the curriculum. And um, I, I've taken several topics from our courses, from navigating money, uh, finances, God's way, and from the financial discipleship courses. Uh, so I suggest you start with an introduction where you talk about goals and make assessments. Then talk about God's ownership, contentment, debts, saving and investing, generosity, budgeting. And then you have a few more meetings to track the progress and to provide accountability and continuous, continuous support. Uh, I've talked to different mentors and coaches, and we recommend having a relationship uh, for about three months, three to four months. And in between this time, you have 10 to 12 meetings. It can be each week or each, every two weeks doesn't matter but in this process you can go through this content you can focus on some areas that are more problem problematic for the person if for example they have debts or if uh, they want to grow in generosity you may have two or three sessions on this and less less on others and here are some uh, some um, uh, books that are referenced uh, in this presentation you can uh, receive them with the powerpoint presentation so I stop here and now you can also uh, ask questions. Yes, I want to encourage you to write your questions on chat or unmute yourself and just ask to Pavel. Yep, yep, we are a small group, so feel free to unmute. Pavel, uh, thank you very much for the complete overview of the whole process and all the elements in it. It looks quite a little bit complex, so it looks like it, um, you need a, to do a lot of um, preparation before you really can um, can come into the process. Is this also, what is your experience with that? Did you prepare all the elements before you started coaching relationship or is it a little bit organic growing in the way uh, you said before you start chatting with somebody and then pieces comes in or do you have to prepare everything beforehand before you can start uh, the coaching? Can you share something about your experience in that? Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. Um... I recommend having some informal meetings uh, at the beginning just for the purpose of uh, building trust. But uh, if you leave the whole process to be organic, it will be just uh, friendly meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there won't be this, and I, I, I can see it, there won't be uh, this uh, transformational experience. Yeah, person may make some changes, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, especially with our difficult topic, uh, you need to be dependent on the Lord. You need to study the word. You need to um, challenge from time to time the client. You need to, the mentee. You need to provide feedback. You need to ask questions. Uh, it's a complex, it's a complex process, yes. And uh, that is why uh, we want to provide a, a, an intensive training in this. So that means from, as a mentor, but also as a mentee, from the beginning, you have to be intentional and really to 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 uh, or a kind of an agreement to reach results yeah and not for the fun let's say being together but really have the end in mind also as your whole process like you said or for your togetherness yes yes based on the rapport between uh, the two of you agree on the goals and the the mentee may come with some uh, more practical goals like having 6 months of uh, savings for emergency fund Mm -hmm. This is very good and practical, but uh, we we can share that we also want to, in this process, um, help them grow in maturity, help them stay closer to God. So I don't recommend having signing signed documents and things like this, but more for, uh, based on the on the open conversations and reach such an agreement for the goals. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Pavel, there is a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, to act as a mentor, do you have to complete a course in this context so we can have training? It's from Filippa. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the question is, for example, let's say um, I would be ready ready to to do uh, this kind of uh, process to to mentor someone. How do you find clients, and do you do you charge? Is it a paid um, mentorship, or is it a how how do you manage that? Yeah, this is uh, this is a uh, long. Uh one uh, question one answer actually <laughs> um in the in we are developing a tool for countries to use so it's our goal as compass europe is to provide you with another tool in your box uh, to grow your ministry so it very much depends how uh, you want to use it you may charge you may not charge uh, we recommend that uh, you don't charge but you um, ask the person to give a donation uh, at the end because they will have experienced the transformation. So this is a recommendation, but it's very much in your hands as a country to decide. And okay. of course, we will develop marketing materials for this, how to spread the news and so on. So there are two ways to spread it. One is through your friends, you know, people in a church, you start meeting them and at some point you ask, you know, offer them to start this relationship. The other way is through advertising. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 